welcome guys welcome in today's session so today we are going to talk about glycolysis and hmb shunt but before beginning with today's topic let us have a small introduction about an academy and as we say in the beginning that let's crack neat pg together so let's crack neat pg together the topic is glycolysis and HMP shunt. First we'll be talking about glycolysis and then we'll be talking about HMP shunt. So a brief introduction about Unacademy. Unacademy is one of the India's largest platform for the preparation of NEET PG and it is one of the best platform these days for the preparation of NEET PG all over India. And uh, the best educators of India, they teach at an academy. So the best thing is you will get, uh, you will be getting mentored by one of the best faculties all over India if you are uh, preparing for a neat PG with an academy. Then uh, with an academy, there is a very special feature that is the special classes. And in these the special classes, what is the best part? That you can ask your doubts and queries directly with the faculty member and they'll be very much willing to answer your queries. So it is very much a normal classroom-like feeling. So you can go for these classes and you can make the most out of this time and you can uh, achieve good marks in VPG. Then uh, there are test series. And as I always say, for uh, qualifying any kind of examination, it is very much important to know the pattern of examination, the PYQs, the MCQs. So that is also possible with an academy as they keep on conducting these test series. So these are three mock tests, weekly tests. So with the help of these tests, you can very well understand that how you have to attempt, then what type of questions will come. And you will also have a knowledge that what questions could come this year. So, test series can be very much beneficial for the students. Then for uh, starting, you what you can do is you can go on Play Store and type Unacademy. Then you will be seeing the logo of Unacademy Learning App. So, just download this Unacademy Learning App and make your account and log in and yes, you are good to go. Then some of the features which are associated with this online kind of learning is the flexibility of schedule. Uh, if you are anywhere all over the world, you can very well... Uh, prepare with the help of an academy because you won't have to be physically present. You can just log in and you can start learning anytime. Then language can be of your choice. There are many faculty members who are teaching in regional languages. So you can uh, make the most out of these videos by learning in your re regional language. Then unlimited practice is another added benefit. Like if a quiz has been taken, then you can retake the quiz as many number of times as you want to. And the videos are once they are live, they are all recorded for uh, future references. So you can anytime watch these re recorded videos and retake the quizzes as many number of times as much you want to. So this unlimited practice is very important. Then you won't feel anything than a normal classroom because you can chat with your educator. Then there are interactive polls and in inter interactive polls you will also understand why a particular option is not right and why a particular option falls in the category of correct. So interactive poll is a very actual inter interactive kind of uh, thing for the classroom. So that is the thing then you can learn anytime anywhere that this we have been saying since ever. Then you can chat with your educator. You can chat with your educator whenever you want to. Uh, during the class and you can ask any doubt you want right then uh, there is this plus subscription and in this plus subscription you will get all the 19 subjects all the lectures will be available for these 19 subjects there will be short term courses crash courses and for these short term courses and crash courses you will be getting the updates and you can anytime enroll in these courses and prepare for the examination then for this plus subscription you need to pay a certain amount and for this certain amount also uh, what I would suggest is go for a 12 monthly or 24 monthly program because then only you will be able to make the most out of the available lectures. Then you can get an additional 10% discount if you are using my referral code that is FB01. 
so by using my referral code that is fp01 you can get an additional discount so don't forget to use my referral code and just go for 12 monthly or 24 monthly subscription and make the most out of it then uh, topic of today glycolysis and agitation so first of all we will be talking about glycolysis glycolysis right so first of all we'll be talking about the introduction and some important points related to glycolysis and then we'll move towards the actual steps of glycolysis so what is this glycolysis actually it is oxidation of glucose to pyruvate or lactate so it is simply oxidation of glucose to pyruvate or lactate first thing then this glycolysis is also called as embedded mare of parnas pathway emp pathway emp pathway and what is the full form of e it's embedded m is for mare of and p is for parnas so EMP pathway. Then what is the importance of glycolysis? Importance. So it occurs in all the cells of the body. Occurs in all cells of body. Occurs in all cells of body. Then occurs aerobically as well as anaerobically. Occurs aerobically and anaerobically both ways right then this is the important source of energy for mature rbcs important source of energy important source of energy so why we are saying that a specifically important source of energy for RBCs because RBCs these mature RBCs they don't have mitochondria so there won't be any kind of oxidative phosphorylation in the mature RBC so the major source of energy is only glycolysis in RBC important source of energy for RBCs because mature RBCs they do not contain mitochondria right so Next importance that whenever there is this vigorous exercise, during vigorous exercise, what will happen? That there will be increased demand of oxygen. Vigorous exercise, increased demand of oxygen will be there. And as there will be low supply of oxygen, so the oxygen will be supplied by the pathway glycolysis because then it will go anaerobically. And it will provide oxygen to muscle cells. To muscle cells. Because this demand of oxygen is not fulfilled in the normal way. So the glycolytic pathway it will go anaerobically. It will go anaerobic. And it will supply oxygen to the cells. Right. Then what are what is the other importance? Uh, the activity of glycolytic pathway is low in cardiac muscles. Glycolytic pathway is low. It's low in cardiac muscles. So what if it is low in cardiac muscles? Because of these low activity, whenever there is myocardial infraction, then what will happen that the there will be poor progression there will be poor progression poor progression or prognosis poor prognosis in myocardial infarction right so hence the energy is not provided anaerobically the energy is not provided anaerobically right so next importance that it is responsible for generation of a skeleton of non-essential amino acid and glycerol of fat so provides skeleton 
of non-essential, the one which are formed in the body. So, non-essential amino acids and glycerol of fat. Then, there are various reversible steps. So, these reversible steps of glycolysis, they are involved in gluconeogenesis. So, reversible steps. are involved in gluconeogenesis. Right, so these are some of the important, so just uh, have a quick revision of these important uh, points about glycolysis that it occurs in all the cells of the body, then it occurs it occurs aerobically as well as it occurs anaerobically. The very important thing. Because many a times the students, they, they get confused in this. Then this is the only important source of energy in RBCs because mature RBCs, they do contain mitochondria. So there won't be any kind of oxidative phosphorylation and there won't be any kind of electron transport chain. So because of absence of electron transport chain in mitochondria, this will provide the main source of energy in RBCs. Then whenever there will be vigorous exercise, there will be increased demand of oxygen. And this increased demand of oxygen, it will be fulfilled by glycolytic pathway as it will occur anaerobically. And uh, the oxygen will be provided by anaerobic uh, respiration to the muscle cells. And that is why it is helpful that way also. Then glycolytic pathway activity is quite low in cardiac muscles. And what is the important importance of it being low in my, uh, cardiac muscles is whenever there will be myocardial infraction, there will be poor prognosis of the symptoms, poor prognosis. Then it provides the skeleton for the non-essential amino acids and also the glycerol which is being used in the synthesis of fats. Then the reversible steps of glycolysis can lead to gluconeogenesis as well will lead to gluconeogenesis. Fine. So these are the importance of glycolysis. Now moving toward the, towards the steps. What are the steps involved in glycolysis? So steps and along with the steps we will be talking about the ATP generation, the NADP generation and everything. So let us start from glucose. This glucose will get converted into Glucose 6-phosphate, glucose 6-phosphate, this glucose 6-phosphate will get converted into fructose 6-phosphate. Fructose, we will be talking about enzymes and everything and all the details but first of all I am just telling you that what are the reactants and what are the products, right. Then fructose 6-phosphate will get converted into fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Right? So, till here. Now, uh, the steps, they are quite lengthy. So, we will be doing it in the next uh, slide. But here, for this much, let us write that what are the enzymes involved and what are the other things. So, the first reaction, the formation of glucose 6-phosphate from glucose, it occurs with the help of hexokinase. Hexokinase or it can be glucokinase as well. Glucokinase. So, this is the place where energy is utilized. So, one of the ATP will be utilized and will get converted into ADP. Then the formation of fructose 6-phosphate from glucose 6-phosphate is a kind of isomerization kind of reaction. So one isomerase enzyme will perform this thing and the enzyme used here is phosphohexokinase. Phosphohexokinase. Uh, sorry, phosphohexoisomerase. I'm saying isomerase and I'm writing kinase. So phospho hexoisomerase phosphohexoisomerase 
Then fructose six phosphate will get converted into fructose one six bisphosphate by the help of enzyme that is phosphofructokinase. Phosphofructokinase. So this step is again energy dependent step, and there will be production of there will be utilization of ATP, and it will get converted into. ADP and most important thing about this step is this is rate limiting step. What do we mean by rate limiting step? A step which is the slowest amongst all, it will determine the rate of whole pathway. So this is the rate limiting step, right? And there are some more things which I need to talk from glucose to fructose six phosphate. That is which reactions are reversible and which are irreversible. So the first step, the formation of glucose six phosphate from glucose, is a irreversible step in the pathway, and this step, formation of fructose one six bisphosphate from fructose six phosphate, is a irreversible reaction. So there are three irreversible reactions. The rest all of the reactions are reversible. So here, this one is reversible. First and third are. Irreversible. So when we'll be doing the further steps, we'll be talking about which one is reversible and which one is irreversible. So let us now begin again from fructose one six bisphosphate. So fructose one six bisphosphate. Now this fructose one six bisphosphate, it will change or it will form two products from here. That is dihydroxyacetone. Di Hydroxy acetone and glyceraldehyde and glyceraldehyde and these steps are actually reversible and these can also be interchanged or they can also be changed. So the enzyme which is used for the formation of glyceraldehyde from dihydroxy acetone. So definitely, it will be kind of isomerase. Isomerase, right? Now the enzyme which is responsible for formation of dihydroxyacetone and glyceraldehyde from fructose one six bisphosphate is aldolase. Aldolase is the enzyme, right? Now let us. Take the steps from glyceraldehyde because dihydroxyacetone it can change into glyceraldehyde as well. So this glyceraldehyde three phosphate glyceraldehyde three phosphate will change into other product and the other product which is formed from glyceraldehyde three phosphate is one three bisphospho. This phosphoglycerate, one six bisphosphoglycerate, and this step it is catalyzed by enzyme. First of all, talking about the enzyme that is glyceraldehyde three phosphate, glyceraldehyde three phosphate dehydrogenase. This is the enzyme, and what is so important about this that it is reversible. Okay, fine. There will be generation of NADH from NAD. NAD will change into NADH, and this NADH is actually responsible for production of 2.5 ATP. 2.5 ATP. So there will be production of 2 NADH. So there will be two times of this. So total five ATP will be generated from this step. Right, and so uh, uh, till now we have used two ATPs, and five ATPs has been generated. So this is how the things are going on. That there will be generation of five ATP at this place, and there will be formation of one three bis phosphoglycerate. Now this one six phosphoglycerate will change into another product that is three phosphoglycerate, three phospho. Glycerate, and here at this place there will be reversible reaction, 
and the enzyme which is used for this reaction is bisphosphoglycerate kinase bisphosphoglycerate kinase and this is a energy dependent step so there will be Genera uh, sorry, this is the only place where there will be generation of ATP directly from ADP. So, this is a very important step because there will be generation of direct ATP. Right? So, very important. Then moving forward in this. From 3-phosphoglycerate, there will be formation of 2-phosphoglycerate. 2 Phosphoglycerate. There will be for formation of 2 phosphoglycerate, and the enzyme which is used for this reaction is mutase or isomerization. Again, this step is isomerization. So, the enzyme used is mutase. Then, this phospho 2 phosphoglycerate will change into phosphoenol pyruvate. Phosphoenol pyruvate and there will be release of water and the enzyme used is enolase. Then this phosphoenol pyruvate step is also reversible. Then there will be formation of from phosphoenol pyruvate, the end product we will get pyruvate. Pyruvate. And this step is also very important because this step is irreversible in nature. There will be generation of ATP. There will be generation of ATP from ADP. And the enzyme used over here is pyruvate kinase. Pyruvate kinase. So, this is how the whole thing is occurring in glycolysis from the very starting. There was glucose and glucose changed into glucose 6-phosphate through an irreversible reaction and glucose 6-phosphate into fructose 6-phosphate through reversible reaction, fructose 6-phosphate into fructose 1,6-bisphosphate through irreversible reaction fructose 1,6-bisphosphate into dihydroxyacetone and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate through reversible reaction and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate into 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate through a reversible reaction and 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate into 3-phosphoglycerate through reversible reaction and this reaction is also reversible formation of 2-phosphoglycerate from 3-phosphoglycerate and then phosphoenol pyruvate is reversible. Then formation of pyruvate from phosphoenol pyruvate is irreversible reaction. So, this is the detailed steps of glycolysis. Now, moving towards another important thing that is whenever this glycolysis will go and aerobic, whenever glycolysis will occur, anaerobically what will happen whenever it will occur anaerobically it will get converted into pyruvate one molecule of pyruvate and one molecule of lactate so whenever it will occur anaerobically there will be generation of pyruvate as well as lactate both of the things right now summing up the thing that is the three steps which are irreversible which is the most important thing Three irreversible steps. Three irreversible steps. So, what are these three irreversible steps? So, the first one we'll be talking about the name of these steps. So, hexokinase step, hexokinase step, or hexokinase reaction is irreversible. Second is phosphofructokinase, phospho fructo. Kinase step is reaction is 
irreversible in nature and it is actually the rate limiting step most important thing it is the rate limiting step then what is so important about this is it is the committed step it is the committed step so let us see this step directly that is whenever there will be formation of glucose 6 phosphate from glucose there is no other fate of glucose 6 phosphate other than entering into the glycolytic pathway so this glucose 6 phosphate formation is the committed step this step is the committed step there will be no other fate of glucose 6 phosphate other than entering into the further glycolysis pathway right so it decides the fate the another thing what you can say say is it decides the fate decides the fate because there is no other fate of glucose 6 phosphate now the third irreversible step of the pathway is pyruvate kinase pyruvate kinase the last one the formation of pyruvate from phosphoenol pyruvate so pyruvate kinase step is again irreversible step so remember the three irreversible irre steps of glycolysis now the very important thing when we were just doing the steps also i told you there is substrate level phosphorylation like formation of direct atp from adp so two important substrate level phosphorylation reactions only two places this am atp is formed from directly adp so two important substrate level phosphorylation two important substrate level phosphorylation so first of this step here is bisphosphoglycerate kinase step this phosphoglycerate kinase that is the formation of three phosphoglycerate from 16 bisphosphoglycerate and what is so important about this reaction reaction or this step is this is reversible this does not fall in the category of irreversible this is reversible then there will be production of energy without electron transport chain that's why we are saying that it is the substrate level phosphorylation there will be no need of electron transport chain for generation of energy here so production of energy without etc production of energy without electron transport chain then second step which performs the substrate level phosphorylation is in the pyruvate kinase pyruvate kinase enzyme so this pyruvate kinase is the last one which is actually forming forming uh, pyruvate from phosphoenol pyruvate so this is also responsible for production of energy without etc without etc without etc production of atp then this last step we have seen just in the last slide also that it is the irreversible step irreversible so these are the two important substrate level phosphorylations mm -hmm. in glycolysis fine now talking about the regulation regulation of glycolysis so regulation is done by three enzymes so first of all uh, i'll just mention the name of enzymes and then how they are responsible for regulating we will be talking about them so first enzyme which is responsible for regulating is hexokinase and glucokinase hexokinase oblique glucokinase then the second enzyme which is responsible for regulation is phosphofructokinase and the third one is pyruvate kinase 
pyruvate kinase these are the three things which are responsible for regulation now talking about the first one that is hexokinase and glucokinase what happens over here so this enzyme is actually inhibited by it is inhibited by glucose 6 phosphate whenever there will be enough glucose 6 phosphate this enzyme or this step will be inhibited so this is the first thing about this then what is the second thing that is it is under the control of insulin it is under control of under control of insulin so what do we mean by that it is under the control of insulin what does this mean it means that insulin activates insulin activates the pathway insulin activates the pathway and glucagon it inhibits the pathway inhibits pathway so it is inhibited by glucose 6 phosphate and it is inhibited by glucagon as well so the two things inhibited by glucose 6 phosphate inhibited by glucagon and insulin it activates the pathway right now talking about the second step of the regulation that is phosphofructokinase phospho fructo kinase what about this phosphofructokinase so we have already talked about this step that this is the rate limiting step isn't it we have talked about that this is a rate limiting step it decides the fate of the pathway so rate limiting step then another thing about this is that it is irreversible irreversible then what else it is activated by insulin this step is activated activated by insulin and it is inhibited by glucagon again the same like above inhibited by glucagon then what else this is actually allosterically inducible enzyme very important thing i should take another color so allosterically allosterically inducible enzyme allosterically inducible enzyme phosphofructokinase what do we mean by allosterically inducible enzyme that is it is activated by amp activated by amp and activated by fructose 26 bisphosphate fructose 26 bisphosphate right and it is activated by amp and it is inactivated by ATP and citrate inactivated by inactivated by ATP and citrate thus it is allosterically inhibited thus allosterically inhibited inhibited right so we have talked about hexokinase and glucokinase we have talked about phosphofructokinase the third thing the third step which is responsible for regulating is pyruvate kinase so what about pyruvate kinase pyruvate kinase so the thing that is important about pyruvate kinase is it is activated by insulin activated by insulin again and inhibited by glucagon inhibited by glucagon and this activation and inhibition is because of the phosphorylation and dephosphorylation reaction in the enzyme right so we have understood the regulation also quite well now let us talk about energetics of the pathway energetics
energetics of glycolysis. So, whenever this glycolysis is occurring aerobically, when occurs aerobically, when occurs aerobically, what will happen during aerobic? We have we have just uh, in the steps we have seen that what happens. So we we have to just now make a list of where the ATPs are used and where they are uh, produced. So there is total generation of seven ATPs. Generation of seven ATPs. Do you remember well that how the seven ATPs are generated? Generation of seven ATPs. The students who are presently online, they can write in the live chat box that whether they are understanding or not. So there will be generation of seven ATPs. And let us just change the slide. There will be generation of two NADPH, and this two NADPH is actually responsible for giving rise to five ATP. And there are two substrate level phosphorylations. So two substrate level phosphorylation. We have just discussed this substrate level phosphorylation. What are, what are the places? So there will be two ATP generated from each step. So that will be total of four ATPs. And consumption, when we are talking about consumption of ATP, so there will be consumption of two ATPs. We have seen there will be consumption of two ATPs. So total from here, nine ATP minus use of two ATPs so in total it is giving rise to 7 ATPs so there is net gain of net gain of 7 ATPs in glycolysis when it is occurring aerobically don't forget this thing also that when it is occurring aerobically now moving forward that is when it is occurring anaerobically during anaerobic during anaerobic During anaerobic glycolysis, what will happen? That this pyruvate will change into lactate. Pyruvate will change into lactate by the enzyme lactate dehydrogenase. And there will be use of NADH. And it will convert it into NAD. So, there again in this lactate generation there will be substrate level phosphorylation so substrate level phosphorylation substrate level phosphorylation will be giving rise to four atps will be giving rise to four atps so four atps from the substrate level utilization and here the nad which is responsible for the uh, utilization so here there will be nothing so four minus two atps which are used so Four and minus two, it will be giving rise to net two ATP. There, in it, NADH was responsible here. This is not responsible, so we are not counting it in the generation part. So four from the substrate level phosphorylation and two which are utilized in these steps. So total there will be generation of only two ATPs anaerobically and aerobically there will be generation of seven ATPs right generation of seven ATPs aerobically fine so we have talked about glycolysis in detail glycolysis is complete now let us talk about HNP shunt that is your H M P shunt Right, HMP shunt or HMP pathway or whatever name we are saying. So students who are live, who are seeing this uh, class live, they can just write in the chat box whether they can understand or not. So this is also called as this is also called as Dickens Horic. Pathway Dickens Horic Pathway. 
and HMP it comes from hexose, hexose, mono, phosphate, hexose, mono, phosphate, and the another name. So the another name is pentose phosphate pathway. Pentose phosphate pathway. Right. Then it is also called as monophosphate pathway. Also called as monophosphate pathway. Monophosphate pathway. And it is also called as phosphogluconate pathway. Phosphogluconate pathway. Then it is also called as phosphogluconate, phosphogluconate oxidative pathway. Oxidative pathway. Right. So what all are the names for HMP shan? It is Dickens Horic pathway, then hexose monophosphate pathway, pentose phosphate pathway, monophosphate pathway. Phosphogluconate pathway, phosphogluconate oxidative pathway. These all are the names given for the HMP shunt. Now, why is it called as pentose phosphate pathway? Why it is called as pentose phosphate pathway? Because there will be generation of lots of pentose sugar. Pentose sugar. That's why it is also called as pentose phosphate pathway and it is the alternative pathway for the oxidation of glucose molecule it's an alternative alternative pathway and because it is the alternative pathway it is called as shunt shunt we are saying that it is hmp shunt so the shunt is because that it is the alternative pathway right so it is alternative pathway for glycolysis and for tca cycle so, this is how the HMP shunt is working and it will be responsible for generation of carbon dioxide from glucose 6-phosphate. The carbon dioxide will be generated from glucose 6-phosphate in HMP shunt. Right. So, let us talk about the important things about HMP shunt and then we will be moving towards this step. So, the important thing that you need to remember in HMP shunt is the oxidative steps they occur in. The oxidative steps occur in liver, then adipose tissues, adipose tissues, then they occur in testes, ovaries, then lactating mammary glands, then uh, occurs in erythrocytes. So, liver, adipose tissues, gonads, lactating mammary glands and RBCs. This oxidative step, it occurs in HMP shunts over here. Over here. Then the non-oxidative steps, non-oxidative steps, non-oxidative steps, they occur in the all cells of the body. They occur in all cells of body. Right? So, non-oxidative step, it occurs in all cells of the body. Then, with the help of pentose phosphate pathway, there will be production of pentose sugar. As we said, that it is called as pentose phosphate pathway. So, this pentose sugar will be produced and this pentose sugar is actually needed for DNA RNA synthesis. DNA RNA synthesis, this pentose sugar is utilized over there. Right? Now, moving towards the actual steps of the pathway, let us talk about the actual steps of this pathway. So, the pathway, it begins with glucose 6-phosphate. It begins with glucose 6-phosphate and there will be 6 molecules of glucose 6-phosphate. This glucose 
phosphate will get a, will get converted into 6 phosphogluconolactone 6 phosphogluconolactone then this 6 phosphogluconolactone will get converted into 6 phosphogluconate 6 Phosphogluconate and this 6 phosphogluconate will get converted into ribulose 5 phosphate. Ribulose 5 phosphate. Right now, talking about the enzymes which are used in these. So, for the first reaction, for the conversion of glucose 6 phosphate into 6 phosphogluconolactone, what enzyme is needed? It is glucose 6 phosphate dehydrogenase enzyme is needed, and this step is rate limiting step. This rate limiting step, and there will be conversion of NADP into NA. DPH plus H positive. Then the conversion of 6 phosphogluconate into 6, pho 6 phosphogluconolactone into 6 phosphogluconate. The enzyme which is used over here, here is gluconolactone hydrolase. Gluconolactone hydrolase. So, if it is hydrolase, there will be removal of water at this step. And the conversion of 6 phosphogluconate into ribulose 5-phosphate, there will be utilization of enzyme 6 phosphogluconate dehydrogenase. Gluconate dehydrogenase. And here, what will happen? The NADP will get converted into NADPH. NADPH plus H positive and there will be release of carbon dioxide. Very important to remember that at this step there will be release of carbon dioxide. And these steps are actually oxidative steps, oxidative phase. Oxidative phase or oxidative steps. And these oxidative steps, they occur in mainly liver and adipose tissues. And also the gonads and lactating memory glands that also we have read. So adipose tissue, this oxidative steps. Right. So NADPH, talking about NADPH, this. Here this NADPH and here this NADPH. So, they are utilized in reductive biosynthesis. So, let us write also about this that NADPH which are produced here. NADPH which are produced, they are utilized in. Utilized in reductive biosynthesis. Then it is used in fatty acid biosynthesis. Fatty acid. Then cholesterol synthesis. Then it is also used for steroid synthesis. Right? So it is used in reductive biosynthesis, fatty acid synthesis, cholesterol synthesis and steroid synthesis. So this was about the oxidative phase and one carbon dioxide is released that also is important to remember this carbon dioxide here. Fine and six molecules of glucose are taking part. So moving forward and talking about the non-oxidative phase. Now, let us write only non-oxidative phase. Non-oxidative phase. 
of the pathway. So we left the thing at ribulose 5 phosphate, right? Ribulose 5 phosphate. Ribulose 5 phosphate. So our oxidative step was ending at ribulose by uh, ribulose 5 phosphate. So if six molecules of glucose is state, taking part in this whole reaction, so there will be generation of six carbon dioxide and there will be generation of six ribulose 5 phosphate. So we will be writing over here that there will be six molecules of ribulose 5 phosphate in the non-oxidative phase and this non-oxidative phase occurs in all cells of body. It occurs in all the cells of the body. Right? So, this ribulose 5-phosphate will change into two molecules two different molecules that is xylulose 5-phosphate xylulose 5-phosphate and it will change into ribose 5-phosphate ribose 5-phosphate and Enzymes which are used in this reaction, talking about the enzymes which is used for this reaction for the formation of xylulose, epimerase is used. Epimerase is used and for formation of ribose 5-phosphate, isomerase is used. Isomerase is used, right? So, there will be formation of xylulose 5-phosphate. So, there will be formation of Four molecules of xylulose 5-phosphate and one molecule of ribose 5-phosphate. And this ribose 5-phosphate is needed for DNA and RNA synthesis because it was the pentose sugar. Right. Now this xylulose 5-phosphate and ribose 5-phosphate, uh, sorry, uh, here we are saying Four molecules of xylulose and here six molecules, uh, two molecules, two molecules, two molecules of ribose 5-phosphate. Now they will be forming further things. So they will be They will be further giving rise to. They will be further giving rise to pseudo heptulose seven phosphate. Pseudo heptulose. It's not looking that clear. Let me just rub it and make it in a better way so that. Now I think it's better. So there will be formation of pseudo heptulose. Seven phosphate. And there will be formation of glycer aldehyde three phosphate. Glycer aldehyde three phosphate. There will be formation of Two molecules of pseudo heptulose and there will be formation of two molecules of glycer aldehyde 3 phosphate. Now, the enzyme which is used for the formation for the formation of pseudo heptulose, the enzyme used is thymine pyrophosphate, and this is a kind of trans ketolase reaction. Trans ketolase reaction, right. And finally, after this, what will happen is, what will happen is this ketoheptolose and glycer aldehyde 3 phosphate, it will be again giving rise to two products that is erythrose 4, 4 phosphate, erythrose 4 phosphate, and it will give rise to fructose 6. Phosphate. So, there will be two molecules of erythrose 4 phosphate and there will be four molecules of fructose 6 phosphate. 
and this reaction is trans aldolase reaction trans aldolase reaction right and what will happen that the cellulose and erythrose it will combine and it will give rise to two molecules of fructose 6 phosphate and two molecules of glyceraldehyde glucose 3 phosphate which will be giving rise to fructose 6 phosphate right so here uh, i'll write in the next slide that this xylose 5 phosphate and erythrose 4 phosphate it will give rise to certain things those are first one is fructose 6 phosphate so two molecules of fructose 6 phosphate will be produced and glucose 3 phosphate there will be again two molecules of glucose 6 phosphate will finally form fructose 6 phosphate so one molecule so one molecule of fructose 6 phosphate so this is how the thing will occur in hmp shunt hope you have understood it well that how it is happening and let us move further in this that this fructose 6 phosphate which we are forming fructose 6 phosphate this which we have formed it is used in the generation of five molecules of glucose 6 phosphate this fructose 6 phosphate will generate five molecules will generate five molecules of glucose 6 phosphate thus it will again go in the hmp shunt because it was starting from glucose 6 phosphate only so here let us just see the calculation of glucose uh, fructose 6 phosphate let us take the highlighter so this fructose 6 phosphate four molecules of fructose 6 phosphate are coming from here and here fructose 6 phosphate is again getting generated here also fructose 6 phosphate is generating so there will be formation of five molecules of glucose 6 phosphate and which is very important for the continuation of the hmp shunt right now let us talk about some of the important things about the hmp shunt so that is utilization of that is utilization of six molecules of utilization of six molecules of glucose 6 phosphate six molecules of glucose 6 phosphate is utilized so the first carbon is liberated as carbon dioxide carbon dioxide liberated from first carbon right and five molecules of glucose 6 phosphate are regenerated five molecules of 6 glucose 6 phosphate are regenerated so there is liberation of six molecules of carbon dioxide in the oxidative phase we have seen also there is liberation of carbon dioxide in the oxidative phase in the oxidative phase right and by decarboxylation which is catalyzed by six phosphogluconate there will be generation of six molecules of carbon dioxide by 6 phosphogluconate dehydrogenase now the six molecules of glucose 6 phosphate plus 12 molecules of natp positive plus six molecules of water is giving rise to five molecules of glucose 6 phosphate plus 12 molecules of natph plus 12 protons plus 6 carbon dioxide so the 10% of glucose is oxidized by hmp shunt 10% of glucose is oxidized by hmp shunt 
and liver and rbcs liver and rbcs they utilize 30% of glucose of this hmp shunt of this hmp shunt right so this is the detail about hmp shunt now moving to the importance of hmp shunt that what is the importance of hmp shunt importance of hmp shunt what is the importance of hmp shunt we'll be talking about each point individually so it is a great source of nadph first thing source of nadph then there will be generation of pentose sugar source of pentose sugar as well so this pentose sugar is used where it is used for synthesis of dna it is used for synthesis of rna it is used for synthesis of fad nad then co enzyme a so there are lots of lots of functions of NADPH and pentose sugar. Now, talking individually about NADPH. NADPH, talking individually about it. Right. So, NADPH in the reduct it is used in the reductive biosynthesis of reductive biosynthesis of used in the reductive biosynthesis of fatty acid steroids and cholesterol right so the very first thing about nadph then talking about then talking about the next thing that is NADPH dependent. So Sanjay Nan is saying that, ma'am, please tell in case of prokaryotic bacteria, how does they produce energy? So glycolytic pathway is the way how it produces energy. This glycolytic pathway is applicable for eukaryotic as well as prokaryotic organisms. So I have just seen your messages just now, Sanjay. Sanjay. Then this NADPH glycolysis is the pathway through which it produces the energy in case of prokaryotic bacteria as well. We are not talking about anaerobic or aerobic. We are talking about prokaryotic bacteria. They will perform glycolysis. Now NADPH, it has got free radical scavenging property. Free radical scavenger. It's a free radical scavenger. Okay. So how does it perform this property of free radical scavenging? Because this superoxide dismutase, then peroxidase and glutathione reductase. Glutathione reductase. These are the enzymes which acts as the antioxidants or they perform the activity of uh, uh, scavenging the free radicals. So NADPH is required for the action of these enzymes and NADPH is also required for the bacteri bactericidal activity of macrophages. Bactericidal activity of macrophages. So, the second is free radical scavenging property. Then the third property of NADPH or the function of NADPH, it is required for the maintenance of RBC membrane. It is required for maintenance, maintenance of RBC membrane. 
so in case whenever there will be decreased an amount of nadph what will happen there will be hemolytic jaundice there will be hemolytic jaundice because uh, nadph is required for production of the rbc maintaining the rbc membrane and it is required for production of glutathione reductase or glutathione reductase is actually nadph glutathione reductase which is required for maintaining the membrane it is nadph dependent it is nadph dependent so reduced glutathione which is formed that is it requires glutathione reductase and glutathione reductase is itself nadph dependent enzyme right reductation i have written it is reductase reductase glutathione reductase for the production of reduced glutathione which is actually responsible for the maintenance of rbc membrane which is which was performing the free radical scavenging property right so this glutathione actually glutathione which maintains the rbc membrane will not be produced in the active form thus the rbc it will undergo hemolysis right now another action of this NADPH is it prevents the formation of methemoglobin right then again the next point about glutathione is it is maintaining uh, it is important in maintaining the transparency of lens transparency of lens then other function is it is responsible for detoxification as well responsible for detoxification so detoxification it performs detoxification by the help of cytochrome p450 and this cytochrome p450 itself is a kind of hydrolase and it requires nadph for its action nadph it requires nadph for its action so NADPH is responsible for xenobiotic degradation or detoxification reaction as well right now talk now talking about the clinical significance of the thing clinical significance of HMP shunt clinical significance clinical significance of hmp shunt clinical significance of clinical significance of hmp shunt first whenever there will be deficiency of glucose 6 phosphate dehydrogenase dehydrogenase there will be deficiency of glucose 6 phosphate dehydrogenase what will happen there will be a asymptomatic condition there will be a a symptomatic condition that asymptomatic condition will be problematic if oxidant drugs are given if if oxidant drugs are given so uh, the oxidant drugs like primaquin or sulfa drugs or antipyretics if they are if they are given then it will cause problem the asymptomatic condition so what will happen they will increase the production of free radical it will increase the production of free radicals so there will be production there will be production of lots of free radicals lots of free yeah, radicals yeah. and thus there will be lots of free radicals and thus the nadph which is nadph which is required for the antioxidant activity it is itself in the decreased amount 
so the rbcs i'll just repeat this point that first point that whenever there will be decreased amount of glucose 6 phosphate dehydrogenase it will cause an asymptomatic condition and if oxidant drugs are given they they will increase the production of free radicals and if itself it is less the nadph deficiency is already there so it won't perform the free radical scavenging activity so there will be increased amount of free radical in the environment and in the rbcs it will cause hemolytic jaundice or it will cause anemia the rbcs they will be damaged there will be destruction of rbcs there is it present in liver only i think cytochrome p50 is it right so yes sanjenan uh, the state oxidation or xenobiotic degradation it occurs in liver so that is right so rbcs destruction will occur and because of destruction there will be release of heme there will be release of heme and because of release of heme there will be increased amount of bilirubin and that is why it will cause jaundice so this is the first clinical significance of your hmp shunt now the second clinical in, uh, significance is of warnix korsakoff syndrome so this warnix korsakoff syndrome it actually occurs in the severe alcoholism whenever there will be severe alcoholism this warnix korsakoff syndrome will occur right so what is about this warnix korsakoff syndrome is that there will be decreased absorption of thiamine occurs in alcoholics occurs in alcoholics and there will be decreased absorption of thiamine and there will be decreased level of thiamine pyrophosphate and if this is happening there will be decreased transketolase reaction there will be decreased transketolase reaction and this is why it will cause certain symptoms in the person so the symptoms for warnix are it will cause global confusion global confusion then there will be ophthalmoplegia ophthalmoplegia then it will also cause ataxia and for korsakoffs which are actually clubbed korsakoff what will happen in korsakoff it will lead to memory loss memory loss and it will also cause psychosis this it will cause psychosis so warnix korsakoff syndrome these are the two uh, syndromes which are club and the symptoms will be like this global confusion ophthalmoplegia ataxia memory loss and psychosis and the reason of thiamine deficiency the reason of thiamine deficiency in alcoholism or alcoholics is because there will be decreased absorption of thiamine from intestine decreased absorption of thiamine from intestine so this will hamper the energy metabolism there will be decreased amount of energy and there will be lots of things which are associated with thiamine deficiency so warnix korsakoff syndrome we have seen and we have seen the first thing let me just take the highlighter so warnix korsakoff syndrome we have seen and uh, we have seen the rbc dix destruction that is whenever there will be deficiency of glucose 6 phosphate how the free radical stress will increase in the body and it will lead to jaundice right and uh, the uses of nadph we have seen which is actually nadph which which is produced in the hmp shunt so importance of hmp shunt is production of pentose sugar which is used in the formation of nitrogenous bases 
formation of the whole uh, actually nucleotide not nitrogenous bases nucleotide so the source of it is a source of nadph and there will be production of pentose sugar then i have got in any in case of any disease if rbc burst then nam our eyes yellow color shows because bilirubin increases in blood yes because there will be increased amount of bilirubin the person will also have this yellow color uh, pigmentation distributed all over the body like skin will also have certain amount of deposition so it will also appear yellow so like this we have completed our hmp shunt as well as our glycolysis and let us just have a very very quick revision of hmp shunt so it starts with glucose 6 phosphate then there will be the first step is the rate limiting in case of malaria or in case of jaundice in case of jaundice in case of jaundice the first step is the rate limiting step then there will be uh, production of ribulose 5 phosphate in the oxidative phase then there will be production of fructose 6 phosphate and erythrose 4 phosphate in the non oxidative phase then the fructose 6 phosphate will actually lead into formation of glucose 6 phosphate that is regeneration of 5 molecules of glucose 6 phosphate and there is utilization of 6 molecules of glucose 6 phosphate and carbon dioxide is liberated in the process so the, and 10 percent of glucose is oxidized by hmp shunt and this 10 percent from this 10 percent the 30 percent is actually utilized in liver and rbcs right then importance we have seen just now clinical significance also we have seen so i think we have completed glycolysis in detail and hope you people have understood glycolysis and hmp shunt so that you can attempt the questions for objectives as well as for your theory exams both of the things so as we say in the end that let's crack neat pg together please subscribe the channel let's crack neat pg and uh, please hit the bell icon for getting all the notifications and please come back for another class um, maybe tomorrow or day after tomorrow so come back for the class uh, and uh, also use my referral code fp01 for getting an additional 10 percent discount and uh, thank you Sanjay, thank you for your compliment. You too have a nice day. Everyone, keep on studying and come back for some other interesting topics in biochemistry that we'll be doing together. Have so, have a very good day once again.